Hey, welcome to my daily devotions for Sunday, September 18th, 2022. And we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 9, John chapter 9, Psalm 121, and the fifth chapter of Esther. Let's take a minute and pray before we do that. Father, uh, take your word and speak to us. Help us just hear you clearly. Make a difference in our lives because we've uh, spent some time together with you in your word. Uh, so speak and use me to communicate it well if I can. And uh, you can, I can't. So use me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Ninth chapter of the book of Romans. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Theirs is the adoption of sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the, of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is who is God over all, forever praise. He said, I would be lost gladly if my brothers and sisters who are Jews could come to Jesus. They, they rejected him, most of them, and he, his heart hurt for them. Our hearts should hurt for those who don't know Christ. And that's, that's, that's the big message there. It is, verse 6, it is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is, it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. Wow, he had mercy on us. He sent Jesus to die in our place, pay our price, set us free. Unbelievable mercy. Verse 17, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you up for this very purpose that I might display my power to you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. He's sovereign. He rules. One of you will say to me, well, then why does God still blame us for who resists his will? But who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Show what is formed, say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? What if God, what if God, choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also not only uh, whom, he, whom he called not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And it will happen that in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. That means the Gentiles. You and I are probably Gentiles. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the Israelites be like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence on earth with speed and finality. It is just as Isaiah said previously, unless the Lord Almighty had left us descendants, we would have become like Sodom and would have been like Gomorrah. 
What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith, but Israel who pursued a law of righteousness has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The stone is Christ. And we're made right by trusting Christ, by having faith in Christ. Powerful, powerful uh, stuff. John chapter 9. John chapter 9. This is where Jesus heals a guy by a pool, as I recall. It's not the first time I've read John many, 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 many times over many, many, many years. I love the Gospel of John. As he went along, he saw a, blind, a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who I must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He's still the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud of the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Imagine that. A weird thing, you know make mud out of spit, put it on a guy's eyes, tell him to wash, and he see. Why? Why did it work? Because it was the word of God from Jesus. That's why. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, he demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus, made some mud, put it on my eyes, told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and, now I, and that, then I could see. Where is this man? They said, I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man could not be from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. They were all tangled up in their little rules. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is he the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now sees? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid the Jews, were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, you know, they couldn't couldn't have that, okay, would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said he's of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind but now I see. Then they asked him, I got lost, sorry. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that's remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. 
Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. It means they threw him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found, found him, said, do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man is a designation for the Messiah. Do you believe in the Messiah is what he's asking who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I've come into the world. So the blind will see and those who see will become blind. In other words, if you are blind, you don't see. He's the guy who can help you with it. And he's talking about spirituality. If you see the things of God, he'll clean up that blindness and we can see it's amazing some pharisees who were who were with him heard him say this and asked what are we blind to jesus said if you were blind you would not be guilty of sin but now that you claim that you see you are your your guilt remains they were guilty because they thought they had it all figured out and they weren't willing to listen to god to help them figure it out Look at Psalm 121. Psalm 121. Oh, this is great. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Oh, folks, you ever need help? It comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I need help all the time. How about you? Yeah, it comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Verse three, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, God doesn't go to sleep when you're having troubles. He doesn't need to sleep. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. Trust the Lord. He will watch over you. Let's jump over to Esther chapter 5 and find out what uh, Mordecai and Esther and Haman and Xerxes and all the folks tangled up in this historical account are up to okay it's amazing stuff esther now is going to make her way into the king and put her life on the line to help god's people and it worked esther chapter 5 verse 1 on the third day esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall the king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance when he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the golden, the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given to you. If it pleases the king, replied Esther, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for him. Bring Haman at once, the king said, so that we may do what Esther asks. So the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared. As they were drinking wine, the king asked, uh, uh, the king again asked Esther, now what is your petition? It will be given you. And what is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Esther replied, my petition and my request is this. If, you, if the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I will answer the king's question. Haman went out th that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Good old Haman was arrogant. Okay, and it's going to come back and bite him. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. 
Calling together his friends and, and Zeresh, his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him and how he had elevated him above other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me not, no satisfaction as long as I see the Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, Have a gallows built 75 feet high and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai hanged on it. Then go with the king to the dinner and be happy. This suggestion delighted Haman, so he had the gallows built. We will see that the gallows come back and bite old Haman. Folks, have a great day. Be blessed. Let's take a minute and pray. Father, thanks for speaking to us. I pray that we would uh, hear what you've had to say to us and that it make a huge difference in our lives. Bless this time together and bless your word to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.